السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد Welcome to our series of a thematic commentary on the Quran for the Friday حلقة at Abu Huraira Center in Toronto So الحمد لله We've been going through the surahs trying to look at the themes, the central themes, main themes in every surah, and also look at the supporting themes and see how they blend together to make a complete case in every surah. And as we uh, study these themes, we see how, what are the main topics the Quran talks about? What are the main uh, subjects the Quran addresses and how this impacts us and how does this help us relate to the Quran and understand the overall message of it. Uh, last week we finished with Surah At-Tawbah and uh, today inshallah we can move to Surah number 10 which is Surah Yunus. So Surah Yunus is one of the Meccan Surahs or Surah al makki the Makki Surahs. And what that means it was revealed before Hijrah. Although the scholars of Tafsir they say there is one verse that seems to be revealed after Hijrah. So for the most part, the surah is actually a Mecki surah or a surah that was revealed before the Hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, it's the first surah in the order of the Quran that is named after a prophet, not in terms of revelation, but in terms of the order of the Quran. So as we start from Al-Fatiha, Al-Baqarah, Ali Imran, this is the first surah that comes in this order that is named after a prophet, which is Prophet Yunus alayhi assalam. Um, and the reason it refers, or it's named after Yunus alayhi salam, Prophet Jonah, is that uh, there is a mention of him and his people. There's a reference, although it's a very short reference, but it uh, blends into, or it actually, it, it, it embodies the central and the main theme in the surah, and that's, uh, most likely, this is why it was called Yunus. And there is no other name known of the surah. You've noticed probably by, by now that some of the surahs have more than one name and they were referred to by more than one title, even at the time of the companions, عنهم, like Surah At-Tawbah, for example. But Surah Yunus is actually, uh, you know, it has one name, Surah, surah to Yunus alayhi assalam. And, um, there is a debate among the scholars, is Surah Yunus among Sab'at Tiwal? Sab'at Tiwal are the seven long surahs in the Quran. Uh, so there is a debate whether it's from them or from the other uh, category. So the Quran is divided generally into four categories or four groups of surahs. The first one is the Sab'at Tiwal, the seven long surahs. Second one is uh, Al Ma'un, uh, which is basically, it's from Mi'a. Uh, and what, what that means basically is that these are surahs whose verses, the number of verses in them are, are around a hundred, either above, a little bit above or a little bit below, or maybe a hundred. Uh, so this is the second group. The third group is Al-Mathani. And Al-Mathani, uh, they are called Al-Mathani because they are repeated. And that's basically because they are recited often in the salawat, in the prayers. And then the last uh, group is Al-Mufassal, which is the last you know, segment of the Quran, starting from Surah Qaf or Surah Al-Hujurat. It's called Al-Mufassal. Sometimes it's also called Al-Muhkam, but mainly it's known as Al-Mufassal. Uh, so again, this debate has to do with actually Surah Al-Tawbah and Surah Al-Infal. Are they considered to be one Surah or not? Uh, something we spoke about. Uh, I believe when we commented in, on Surah At-Tawbah. But let's get into Surah Yunus. What is the central, what does Surah Yunus talk about? Surah Yunus talks about articles of faith. It really talks about the oneness of Allah, the unity of Allah, his soul right to be worshipped, that he is, and everything that is linked to that. So his rububiyyah, his lordship, the fact that he is the Lord, the creator, the initiator of the universe. He is the sustainer, the provider, the one who takes care the one of, of it, the one who keeps it running, the one who keeps it in shape. That's a rub. And his beautiful names and attributes, his perfection <clears throat> and his exaltedness and how all of this 
makes just one clear conclusion that no one deserves our worship and our devotion, but Allah alone. And somehow in Surah Yunus, this fact becomes so obvious and clear, unless again, we are blinded by desires and ambitions. Um, then it talks it also talks about the message, which is belief in the divine messages and divine revelations. Uh, and, and this is the context in which this surah actually, uh, with, or the framework, I would say, that the surah functions within, because the reference is to the message of the Quran, the book, the, the Quran, the wise book, the Quran, and the message that was sent specifically to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So here is belief in, you know, revelation. Uh, and then there is a mention also of prophets. So there is belief in the prophets. And there is a lot of emphasis on belief on the uh, day of judgment and imanu bil yawm al akhir, belief on in the last day. So these are the articles of faith that are emphasized. So the whole surah is actually about this and very powerfully, very beautifully. And uh, for some reason, Surah Yunus, when you recite it, it just takes you into, somehow it takes you into a completely different world of, um, again, the oneness of Allah, the reality of this life, especially when it emphasizes, you know, resurrection and the next life. And uh, when the emphasis is there on the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending guidance to humanity through prophets and messengers and how people responded to that. And there is a mention or there is some reference to, you know, what's going to happen, obviously, to the people who remain truthful, remain loyal to Allah, remain loyal to their, to their pure human nature, which is the fitrah, uh, as opposed to those who choose blindness, those who detach from, you know, the, the, the original state of purity and fitrah that humans were created upon. Um, and uh, I was thinking of maybe going through the surah a little bit more. Um, I thought, shall I just, shall we just go over it uh, in one day or shall we give it a bit more attention? And I thought, you know, Surah Yunus is quite profound and let's let the surah lead the way here. So what I'm going to do is try to just go over the, all of the surah. And if this basically lends itself to us uh, and see how far we go. And I would really like the surah to lead the way here rather than me imposing something on, 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 on the content of the surah. I just feel more comfortable dealing with surah Yunus this way. So we start with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts the surah with Alif Lam Ra, Tilka Ayatul Kitab Il Hakim. And this is actually where the central theme really is. Allah says Alif Lam Ra, the, these are the, uh, the verses, the signs of the wise book or the book that is wise. And this is the revelation. This is the Quran that was sent to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is a very deep and profound and profound statement that this Quran contains wisdom. And this wisdom obviously comes from the one who in originated the Quran, the one who spoke the Quran, and that's Allah Subhanahu, the one who authored the Quran, that's Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. He's wise and thus his revelation reflects this wisdom. Uh, and this this revelation was sent to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and part of the wisdom in it is actually that it calls to the belief in the one true God and that it points to the reality of this life and that's basically it's temporary and it's not the whole point it's an incomplete story uh, there is a life after that because this life doesn't stand on its own it doesn't make any sense it needs as I said it's an incomplete a picture and it can only make sense you know when we believe in the next life and that everything will be settled and everything will be put in place uh, there is a, a and this verse has been echoed through the surah and sometimes very clearly it's been articulated and, and i think and this is where there is some kind of a competition as to uh, where is the central I would say theme, what does it really appear? Is it the first verse, obviously with the second one, which highlights how people have responded to this message of truth from their Lord. But there is also verse number 57 and 50, uh, oh, so 56, yeah, 57 and 58, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and I lean more towards this, 
والله سبحانه وتعالى says يا أيها الناس قد جاءتكم موعظة من ربكم وشفاء لما في الصدور وهدى ورحمة للمؤمنين قل بفضل الله وبرحمته فبذلك فليفرحوا هو خير مما يجمعون الله says all humanity so Allah calls upon humanity draws their attention a موعظة a reminder an admonition an advice has come to you from your Lord and we say again again admonition a reminder, advice, that basically means it's got your best interest in mind. This is, this is why it's designed. And, uh, and, and uh, mawida, again, carries the, the depth of a profound message that is holistic in the sense it doesn't only address you intellectually in terms of ideas. It addresses you emotionally. It addresses you spiritually it's very profound it take, it addresses all of the components of the human experience min rabbikum from your lord and here is there's we should be able to feel the compassion that this has come from someone who cares about you someone who runs your affairs someone who makes everything work for you the the it, it is allah who you know beats your hearts and keeps your lungs breathing and keeps everything functioning within you and keeps everything functioning around you to make your life you know, possible, a reality. That's your Lord. He's running your affairs. Even if you are blinded to this fact, it's time probably to wake up to it. So this kind of advice has come to you from your Lord and it also contains, or it is also a healing, a source of healing. It, it cures you. It cures what? It cures, it cures the ailments that could, in, that could actually uh, encroach uh, on the on the on the chests of humans and this is where the heart is this is where again the essence the core of humans is uh, a healing and a guidance and mercy for the believers because this healing contains the guidance and it delivers the guidance but not every place not every human being is receptive to that not everyone is allowing it to come in. Some people initiate some kind of a, a, a block, some kind of a wall to, and, and that wall does not allow this guidance and this mercy to arrive to their state of being, to become a reality in their life. Uh, so this is why Allah says it's guidance and mercy for the believers. For, in the case of the believers, it is guidance and mercy and healing. So, in order for this divine work of guidance and healing to work, uh, you have to be receptive. And it's not like hard work to be receptive because you are already in a state of reception. You are created, designed initially by default in a state of reception. So we on, it's only when we depart from this pure human nature that we actually uh, create or erect some kind of a, a wall between us and the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the following verse says, Allah says, Qul bifadlillahi wa birahmatihi. Say to them, say, O Muhammad, and obviously this applies to Muslims, uh, let them rejoice. The, their happiness, their, uh, some, the joy should come from the, the blessings of Allah, the mercy of Allah that comes to you, which is the revelation, because that's the most precious gift. It, it again because the gifts of Allah come to everyone and they, they and everyone is enjoying them but the the the, the climax of Allah's blessings the, the the height of the 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 generosity of Allah is actually by showing people the truth the guidance what's the reality of this life what is your the reality of your existence what is life about and where are you heading to what what are you supposed to do uh, so this is the most precious gift and, and that's what we should be happy about and you should be happy about the things that that are going to you know stay with you eternally right that's a gift that doesn't die when you die that doesn't cease to exist when you leave this world it's it's going to stay with you the benefits of it are are everlasting whereas the other blessings if you look at them they're temporary they are finite there will be a point when they will not be in your life or maybe you will not be there to enjoy them, to enjoy them. So you're just going to leave or they are going to leave you. So again, a, a, the wise, they would 
appreciate and hold on to, you know, what is going to last with them eternally to the more, I would say, eternal blessings rather than the finite, short-lived, fleeting, temporary blessings. That's, 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 that's what we should hold on to, the things that would remain with us, the, the things that would not leave us. And that's the guidance and revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, let them be happy about this because this is better than what the, all of everything they possess and everything they gather and hoard. So I think this is where, what, where the theme is about. So the surah goes on to uh, explain in detail, speak in detail about the, the content of this revelation and what does it offer. So let's, let's go over. We, we mentioned the first verse. Let's talk about the second verse. Allah says, أَكَانَ لِلنَّاسِ عَجَبًا أَنْ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ رَجُلٍ مِّنْهُمْ أَنْ أَنْذِرِ النَّاسِ وَبَشِّرِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنَّ لَهُمْ قَدَمَ صِدْقٍ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ قَالَ الْكَافِرُونَ إِنَّ هَذَا لَسَاحِرٌ مُّبِينٌ Allah says, is it like a source of wonder for people that we sent a man from amongst themselves to warn humanity? It's a wake-up call. The Quran, Revelation, Prophets and Messengers were always a wake-up call when humanity departed and left their true nature their default nature of knowing their lord uh, and and they got lost in their thinking and in their desires and in their lifestyle and and they they blinded themselves they became deadened to reality they started living in, in a more of a virtual reality that is the function or that is the product of you know a a, a, a mind made you know, reality, sort of a virtual reality that is made by humans. Uh, and, 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 and that's a very serious thing because this is what Allah describes as ghafla. People are in a state of ghafla, heedlessness. They are like hypnotized. People are in a trance. Uh, they're unable to see the truth when, it's cre when it is screaming in their face. And that's what ghafla is. Some, usually it's translated as heedless but again meaning you are blind to the truth that what ghafla is and we need to awaken to the truth that is right in our face uh, so that's why Allah sent warnings so Allah sent, sent prophets and messengers to wake people up to the reality of life to the obvious reality of life to wake them up from their coma um and give glad tidings to the believers, those who have remained loyal, truthful to Allah. They remained uh, authentic. They remained uh, true to their nature, to their true nature of guidance and recognizing the truth and working according to it. Uh, so the Quran is going to serve as glad tidings for them. Why? Because again, it's based on the truth and it says whoever remains aligned with the truth then going to, they're going to reap the fruits of that. But those who refuse it, those who reject it, those who insist on being blind, uh, those who deaden themselves to reality, those people, you know, they just decided to miss out on this mercy and these blessings and all of the rewards that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in store. Uh, yeah, and Allah says, قَدْ إِنَّ لَهُمْ قَدْ مَصِدْقٍ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ It's a beautiful description here that they have a foot of truthfulness with their Lord. So there is, um, there are different opinions as to what qadamas qadamu sidqin means, which is a foot of truthfulness. What does that mean? Uh, so there are a few opinions. Uh, some of them mention that this is Allah's eternal knowledge uh, about uh, who was going to enter paradise, that Allah destined some people even before the creation of the heavens and the earth, Allah destined some people to paradise. And again, this is not a random choice. This is not a random thing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because everything Allah does uh, is based on his knowledge, wisdom, justice, mercy, etc. So, uh, so, but it's just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows things before they take place. So some of them say this is the foot of truthfulness. And some of the mufassirin or the scholars of tafsir, they say it's basically it's good deeds because the de good deeds are the foot or the steps that take you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Both meanings are actually correct. The disbelievers, and again, these people who have departed, you know, human, human nature. They left it. They're no longer there. They, they're no longer uh, functioning, uh, having the right kind of functioning. They, they have adopted some kind of a phony... Um, 
fabricated system that is full of again viruses, bugs, etc., and is causing them to, causing them to see the world in a completely inaccurate terms. But again, it's just you know because it's very common and it's 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 practiced commonly, so it sort of gets or gives a false air of authority and and validity. Um, so so they say, oh, this is pure magic. This is like obvious, clear magic. Uh, talking about revelation, that's not true. And and this shows that unless you know we humans, we really we unless we are unless we humble ourselves and we are sincere in seeking the truth and we really cry out to Allah to show us the truth it's easy for our minds when they are under the influence and the intoxication under the intoxication of our desires and our false sense of self it's easy for these uh, for this mind to you know to deceive us and create some kind of a a, a virtual reality some kind of a matrix where things seem to make sense but again it's a matter of perspective and this 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 uh, view on life or this matrix blinds us to the obvious truth that is available to everyone then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizes here again the concept so here comes the concept of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's the core of the message the core of this wise book and Allah here starts by emphasizing the, his lordship, that he's the creator, the originator, the master, the owner, the sustainer of the world. And from there, you know, the obvious conclusion is that you should be worshipping him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ رَبَّكُمُ اللَّهُ الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ فِي سِتَّةِ أَيَّامٍ ثُمَّ اسْتَوَى عَلَى الْعَرْشِ so inna rabbakum inna rabbakum allah alladhi khalaqa as-samawati wal arda fi sittati ayyamin thumma istawa 'ala al-'arsh indeed your lord is allah your and lord again there is compassion there is care there is uh, so much uh, rearing and 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 taking care of uh, in the word rabb right alladhi khalaqa as-samawati wal arda he's the one who created initiated he he brought into existence the heavens, the earth, which is the universe, the, the known universe, which is extremely vast and big beyond even our imagination. You know, the, the, the amount of measures that keep coming almost every year from, uh, uh, from, from people who study, uh, you know, space are just astronomical, phen like phenomenal, like, right? They are still this this universe is just a tiny bit it's just a tiny bit it's nothing it's simple but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens and the earth in six days and allah could create things in an in instantly but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us a, a, a lesson and there are many reasons why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that he created the heavens and the earth in six days and they are these are not like our days because time with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is different than time as we know it in our dimension of this worldly life so uh, there is the concept of a rifq here, which is incrementalism, gradual, step by step things. Allah is teaching us that things take time. Things don't, you know, mature or grow overnight. Things are not achieved immediately. So it's the nature of this world because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused it. In a sense, if you, if you like, you know, things need to ferment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us, is saying this is how this world was built, built and this is the nature of this world. So the, the, the world draws its nature and its laws from even the way Allah created it. So it takes time. So yeah, and, and, and this is one area where patience comes in. ثُمَّ اسْتَوَى عَلَى الْعَرْشُ Then Allah rose above the throne. Again, this concept of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah rose above the throne. This is mentioned seven times in the Quran, this specific, you know, expression, stawa al-arsh, that Allah rose above the throne. And um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator. He's not like the creation. Uh, so when Allah describes himself in a way, it is true. It is true. And there is, we, there is no need for us to deny, you know, the meaning of 
the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or try to change their meaning and think that they indicate something inappropriate in the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's, it's as simple as that. Uh, you know, something is true to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially if he describes himself this way, or the Prophet وسلم, in an authentic narration ex describes Allah in a specific way. We have no reason to reject it or change its meaning or act in denial to what it suggests. Uh, and we should separate sometimes some elements that, you know, that are in our understanding and they get attached or entangled with the divine description. And then we think, oh, you know, we that's inappropriate. We need to deny the meaning. We need to change the meaning. We need to come up with another interpretation, right? But the problem is not with the expression. It's not with the truth of the expression and even the literal meaning of the expression. The problem is with how our minds interpreted that or some of the, uh, again, some of the attachments that our minds have added to this meaning. So Allah rose above the throne in a way that befits his majesty. Again, it, it, uh, it doesn't mean Allah needs something to rise upon. It doesn't mean Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs a place to rest on. It doesn't mean Allah depends on the throne. Because if you think this way, you're just overusing your mind. You're, you're comparing Allah to his creation already. But anyway, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself is just the truth. And we leave it at that. And we don't allow our minds to go into the details of how but in our hearts. And that's what a heart of a believer can easily do, is that we acknowledge that this is a true attribute of Allah and the heart feels at peace with it. And it doesn't need to create an image because images come from trying your mind trying to create a mental image of Allah. And that's the wrong way to go about the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This applies not only to an attribute like this, it applies even to the name of Allah as Samia, al basir it applies to the name of Allah, al alim It applies to all of the names of Allah. So it becomes a very problematic approach. The right approach with the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that if they are, the meaning is correct and clear in the Quran and in an authentic narration from the Prophet وسلم, is that we accept them according to the language, because the Quran was sent in the language of the Arabs at the time of the Prophet وسلم, according to the understanding of the Arabs at the time. Sometimes, some of us contemporary human beings, we might, because sometimes there's a distance in time, some meanings are not used as they are used today. Or maybe what seems to be to be literal to us as, as beginners and may, maybe intermediate students who are learning the Arabic language and our unawareness of how these words were used at that time, we might think mistakenly that hey the literal meaning is is inappropriate right but the way you understood this literal meaning is actually is is wrong because you don't know how these words or you have not studied how these words were used at the time with um, uh, by the arabs at that time uh, uh yeah so this is how 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 we go about with the names and attributes of allah and this adds so much faith you know and keeps the heart you know, humble and doesn't allow our minds to go wild trying to process the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because what believes in Allah, this is a matter of belief and the belief is in the heart. Belief is not an idea where you just, you know, process Allah as a mental construct. A construct. This, you're going to go wrong with this. Absolutely, you're going to go wrong with this. It's the heart that relates to Allah. And the, the way the heart knows is not like the mind. The heart has a knowing. It has an inspiration from Allah. It's, it's from this fitrah. It's from a different world, the world of the unseen. And the way it knows and the way it relates to the names and attributes of Allah is not through mental images. And this is why there is no need to you know, start denying because you can only deny if you create a mental image. And any mental image you create is inappropriate of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we relate to Allah in our hearts, not in our minds. Yudabbiru al-amr. Allah is the one who runs the affairs of the universe, of the world. Everything is run by Allah. Everything, the big and the small, the smallest things, everything, every process, every biological, physical, chemical process that takes place is run and managed 
and monitored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything big and small in this universe. No one intercedes, no one offers counsel or anything or, or an opinion with Allah except by Allah's permission. That's absolute control and dominion. That is Allah, your Lord. So worship Him. Again, that makes that's very compelling. It's quite obvious. And we can only fail to see this compelling logic if we are obsessed with ourselves and our desires and you know our ambitions and trying to and, and our false sense of self when we are it's when we are so much our life is so much about ourselves right but this logic is quite simple compelling and 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 unavoidable don't you remember aren't you reminded and then that, that shows that actually this is something that is built in us. All we need to do is just wake up to it, recover it, and, and see it as, as, the, as the truth. <inaudible> to Allah will be your return. All of you shall return to Allah, the promise of Allah in truth. It's a true promise by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this shows, you know, you began, your beginning is from Allah, and your return is going to Allah. So you're going to eventually you're going to return to Allah and you can do that either willfully or you can do that uh, meaning you know by by force you, because you're going to return so return to Allah in your heart and that's by worshiping him and that's part of the meaning uh, of the names of Allah al awwal wal akhir you know the, the, he's the first and he's the last He's the initiator. One of the meanings there is that he's the initiator. He started everything. He's the one who created life force and gave it to the creation and provided us with it. And thus this life force is all from Allah. This whole life, everything is just from Allah. And it's supposed to be directed back to Allah full, cir full circle. Um, and that's really what worship is. So that's the awwal wal akhir. Things start with him and things are supposed to end up with him. Things are supposed to return to him. So we either become part of this complete process or we reject it. And that's when we reject faith. And that's when we create dissonance in our lives and in our experience. And that ends up with punishment, unfortunately. <sighs> He's the one who initiates and starts the creation, creates us the first time. Then he creates us again. He brings us back to life again. So Allah creates us, gives us life. Then he gives us death, takes life away. We die. Then he gives us life again. And we are resurrected. We brought to life back again. And we're going to obviously eventually return to him. Why does Allah do all of this? Why did Allah create the whole creation? Because Allah wants to reward those who remain truthful and loyal to Allah. Allah wants to honor them. Allah wants to honor them, put them where they truly belong. Uh, those who believe and do righteous deeds, Allah is going to give them what? You know, you know they're due. What about those who act unfaithfully to their, again, to Allah, to their nature? What about those? Those who create dissonance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those people, those who act in denial and rejection to their very nature, very human nature. Allah says, these people, Now for those people who have disbelieved, there will be um, Again, the boiling hot drink of the hellfire and a very severe punishment because of their disbelief. Kufr, again, kufr is dissonance. Uh, kufr is a rejection of, you know, human nature in, in its essence. It's about uh, rejection of the truth, rejection of the, of the obvious truth, choosing to live in blindness. Then Allah, again, sort of sandwiches this uh, in in uh, uh, this concept of worship between first it started with his lordship that he's the rabb he's the one who takes care of the creation and then and after mentioning the concept of worship 
he again brings about the concept of lordship again where Allah says huwa alladhi ja'ala ash-shams sadiyan wal qamara nuran wa qaddarahu manazila li ta'lamu 'adada as-sinina wal hisab ma khalaqa Allah dhalika illa bil haqq he's the one who made the sun a source of illumination and the moon as um, a light uh, or as yeah as a light or, or as bright and he made the moon move according to you know stations there are stations there are degrees for the moon so that you can count the 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 uh, you can count time and the years ma khalaq allah dhalika illa bil haqq allah created this only in truth that means look at how allah the whole universe is created for you it's your home so it's custom made for you by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you can see that you are meant with all of this like sun sustains you gives you the gives you the warmth gives you the the uh, the light that is necessary for your life without you paying for it allah gave you the moon as well that illuminates and that it, and that and it helps you you know number the the days the the and and keep count of of time be able to relate to time in terms of something that is very anchored in the physical reality um Allah says all of that look at all, all of that Allah created it in truth it's again it's designed for you it is it is tailored uh, to your needs uh, and and this is this is sign that you are intended in the creation uh, and and that there is there is this purpose and this purpose revolves around you around uh, everything there in the universe if you look around is just making a, a beautiful story a compelling case that you know it's designed to make your life possible to help you flourish in this world to help you grow and because you are here on a mission to help you fulfill this mission as simple as that it cannot be random it cannot be a product of chance um and it would be very blind to actually see it this way because and this kind of system this kind of organization this kind of purposefulness in the universe is quite obvious it's it's in your face and if you're not seeing it you're just not you're deadened you have deadened yourself to the obvious reality and you are just again created a stream of thought that you think is reality is just became you, you are in a delusional state you're missing the reality that is obvious um so allah says allah clarify yufassil al-ayati liqaumi ya'lamun allah clarifies and makes his signs so clear and evident to those who know know what again those who are open to the truth those who are not living in that trance that and this kind of blindness then allah again allah emphasizes inna fi ikhtilaf al-layl wa an-nahar wa ma khalaqa allah fi as-samawati wal ardi la'ayatin liqaumi yattaqun indeed in the uh, change and the alternation of the night and the day and whatever what uh, and everything allah created in the heavens and the earth there were signs for people who have taqwa people whose hearts are alive and again is just that this this gives us comfort that look around in the world everything is taken care of everything is perfectly designed the smallest the biggest and the smallest details are all designed and purposeful there's no randomness you are the center of this whole care you are the target of this care you should feel very well taken care of you should feel that you are the center of attention here in that sense but again you are the sense of sense of attention not in a selfish way not in a self-centered fashion but it's actually to realize that you are part of this bigger context and you are meant to fulfill something this whole context is created to propel you and to enable you to fulfill this purpose and that's actually the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, then Allah shows how people respond to this either are they see it and uh, and embrace it and live in truth or they either insist on living in a delusional state where they depart from the truth and they are blinded completely to it so Allah says inna alladhina la yarjuna liqa'ana wa radu bil hayati ad-dunya wa tma'annu biha wal ladhina hum an hayatina ghafilun ulaika ma'wahum an-nar bima kanu yaksibun verses 7 and 8 Allah says those who do not look forward to meeting us because of they don't look forward to it because they have denied it and because they have been sucked into as we said some sort of a virtual created reality 
which is not true, a delusional one, <clears throat> and which is based on their desires. It, they're caught in a vicious cycle of, you know, worshiping their desires. And obviously these people, when they see the truth, they don't like it because it breaks and it spoils, you know, their, their reality for them. It exposes it. So they're not happy with it. They're not looking forward to meeting Allah. They actually hate that, the, the notion of that. So, but they are pleased with this life. They wish that it perpetuates itself and that they could remain in it. And they are so blinded to the very obvious and evident fact that it is temporary and they are going to leave it eventually. And they have become very settled in it. So these people are in a state, an ayatina ghafilun. These people, the signs are all around them, but they are unable to see them. They are blind to them, as if they live in another dimension. And this dimension is their own work. It's not like something imposed on them. It's the product of their own, you know, work inner workings. This kind of life, this kind of approach leads people to what? Eventually their destiny will be the hellfire because of this whole system and what it produces. Then Allah says, <laughs> And those who remain truthful, those who believed in Allah, remained upon this natural state of faith and they've done obviously righteous deeds because it's a system and it produces it has products Allah guides them he even guides them further he opens up this nature it makes you makes it flourish even more it unfolds even more due to their iman due to their truthfulness here and you see that Allah doesn't just guide randomly rivers will flow underneath in the gardens of bliss and beauty and joy and that's paradise Allah explains you know what kind of lifestyle they have a glimpse into the lifestyle they have in paradise Allah says they keep calling upon Allah making tasbih subhanallah glory be to Allah subhanallah subhanallah like, that's their joy and, and this shows that we are given a glimpse in this world, we are given a glimpse into paradise. That the remembrance of Allah is so joyful, is so blissful, is so beautiful. But, and if we're not feeling it, that be, that's because we're not completely in tune with our pure nature. Where we're doing it probably just verbally, right? But not, our hearts are not engaged. And that's very problematic. So people in paradise, how do they spend their time? They want more joy by Engaging in the remembrance of Allah. There's nothing more joyful, joyful than engaging with Allah directly by remembering his name with your tongue and your heart having uh, what is called by the scholars mukafaha, basically direct communication, direct experience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The way they greet each other, the way they are greeted by the angels is all about peace peace that divine peace that comes from Allah and the way they conclude or finish any segment of speech they say is by saying Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen praise be to Allah we're so glad and thankful and appreciative uh, of Allah because of who he is and because of how he's been treating us and because of everything so that's these are the two ends possible ends so I think it's uh, it's good to to stop here, and inshallah, uh, next week we will carry on. So we stopped at the end of verse number ten. Jazakum khairan again for joining us. We've been speaking about Surah Yunus, trying to take a thematic one, although this is a little bit more detailed. But the Surah is just so beautiful and so profound, and I think it's 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 a, it's a joy just to to go to go through it. So see you inshallah next Friday. Jazakum khairan. Wassalamu alaikum. ورحمة الله وبركاته